Warning, all attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello everyone, I'm Sean Esterly with the National Renewable Energy Laboratory and welcome to today's webinar which is being hosted by the Clean Energy Solution Center in partnership with UN Foundation's Energy Access Practitioner Network. Today's webinar is focused on the sustainable energy solutions for health facilities. And before we begin, I'll quickly go over some of the webinar features. For audio, you have two options. You may either listen through your computer or over your telephone. If you choose to listen through your computer, please select the mic and speakers option in the audio pane. Doing so will eliminate the possibility of feedback and echo. And if you choose to dial in by phone, please select the telephone option and a box on the right side will display the telephone number and audio pin that you should use to dial in. And if anyone is having technical difficulties with the webinar, you may contact the GoToWebinars help desk at 888-259-3826. If you'd like to ask a question of our panelists, uh, we ask they use the questions pane where you may type in your question and submit it, and we will ask those during the question and answer session at the end of the webinar. And if you're having difficulty viewing the materials through the webinar portal, you will find PDF copies of the presentations at cleanenergysolutions.org forward slash training, and you may follow along at this, as, as the uh, speakers present. Also, the audio recording of the presentations will be posted to, to the Solution Center training page within a few days of today's broadcast. And we will also be adding the recording to the Solution Center YouTube channel where you will find other informative webinars as well as video interviews with thought leaders on clean energy policy topics. Finally, one important note of mention before we begin our presentation is that the Clean Energy Solution Center does not endorse or recommend specific products or services. Information provided in this webinar is featured in the Solution Center's resource library as one of many best practices resources reviewed and selected by technical experts. And today's webinar agenda is centered around the presentations from our guest panelists, Luke Saveri, Tinian Ogihor, Virginia Taborda, and Laura Stachel, who have joined us to discuss approaches to delivering sustainable energy solutions in the health se uh, sector, and we thank them very much for joining us. We will begin with short presentations from each panelist, followed by a discussion led by Luke before returning to the audience question and answers. Before we jump into the presentations, I just want to provide a quick overview of the Clean Energy Solution Center and Clean Energy Ministerial, who are bringing, uh, sponsoring this webinar. And then following the panelist presentations, we will have a question answer session where the panelists will address questions submitted by the audience. And at the end of the webinar, you will be automatically prompted to fill out a brief survey. And we just thank you in advance for taking a moment to respond to that. Uh, so the Solution Center was launched in 2011 under the Clean Energy Ministerial, and the Clean Energy Ministerial is a high-level global forum to promote policies and programs that advance clean energy technology, to share lessons learned and best practices, and to encourage the transition to a global clean energy economy. There's 24 countries, including the European Commission, um, as members, and covering 90% of clean energy investment and 75% of global greenhouse gas emissions. And the Solution Center is one of the nine initiatives of the Clean Energy Ministerial. Other SEM initiatives include ISCAN, 21CPP, and Global Leap. And all the initiatives work towards the three overarching goals of improving energy efficiency worldwide, enhancing clean energy supply, and expanding clean energy access. <clears throat> And now for an overview of the Solution Center. Uh, this web webinar is being provided by the Clean Energy Solution Center, which focuses on helping government policymakers design and adopt policies and programs that support the deployment of clean energy technologies. This is accomplished through support in crafting and implementing policies relating to energy access, no-cost expert policy assistance, and peer-to-peer -peer learning and training tools such as this webinar. And the Clean Energy Solution Center is co-sponsored by the governments of Australia, Sweden, and the United States with in-kind support from the government of Mexico. And there's five primary goals for the Solution Center. First goal is to serve as a clearinghouse of clean energy policy resources. Second is to share policy best practices, data, and analysis tools specific to clean energy policies and programs. Third goal is to deliver dynamic services that enable expert assistance, learning, and peer-to-peer -peer sharing of experiences. 
And the Solution Center also fosters dialogue on emerging policy issues and innovation around the globe. And then finally, the Solution Center serves as a primary resource for project financing options and information to expand markets for clean energy. Our primary audience is made up of energy policymakers and analysts from governments and technical organizations in all countries. But then we also strive to engage with the private sector, NGOs, and also civil society. And the Solution Center is an international initiative, and we work with more than 35 international partners across a suite of different programs. Several of the partners are listed above and include research organizations like IRENA and the IEA, programs like SE for All, and regionally focused entities such as the ECOWAS Center for Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency. And one of the marquee features that the Solution Center provides is its no-cost expert policy assistance known as the Ask an Expert program. And the Ask an Expert program matches policymakers with one of the more than 50 global experts that we've selected as authoritative leaders on specific clean energy finance and policy topics. For example, in the area of energy access, we're very pleased to have Catherine Dianvala from Access Accessible Energy serving as one of our experts. So if you have a need for policy assistance in energy access or any other clean energy sector, we do encourage you to use this valuable service. And again, the assistance is provided to you free of charge. So if you have a question for our experts, please submit it through our simple online form at cleanenergysolutions.org forward slash expert. We also invite you to spread the word about this service to those in your networks and organizations. And now I'd like to go ahead and provide some brief introductions for today's very distinguished panelists. First up today is Luke Saveri, who leads a multi-year, multi-country intervention focusing on the deployment of sustainable PV energy solutions in primary healthcare facilities at the UNF. And then following Luke, we will hear from Tinian Ogehor, who is a technical advisor for solar PV at Solar Nigeria program where he brings to bear a wide breadth of renewable energy experience, both locally and internationally. And then our third speaker today is Virginia Taborda, who is the Director of Business Development at Solar Kiosk and is responsible for the interface with all business-to-business -business partners to bring Solar Kiosk solutions to the base of the pyramid and other underserved communities. And our final speaker today is Laura Stachel, who is the Executive Director of We Care Solar, which she co-founded to bring simple solar electri electric solutions to maternal and child health care in regions without reliable electricity. And so with those introductions, I'd now like to uh, welcome Luke to the webinar. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on which time zone you're, uh, you're calling in from. Just give me one second to pop up my screen. There you go, it should be shared right now. Um, I'll just start off uh, this webinar with a, uh, with a quick introduction to, to the Energy Access Practitioner Network and, and also, of course, the, the topic of the day, which is powering healthcare. Uh, energy is, is essential to development, but today, more than one billion people still suffer from, from a lack of energy access. Many more experience frequent outages and generally have unreliable access which further hampers social and economic development. In 2011, uh, the UN Foundation launched the Energy Access Practitioner Network to help address the energy access challenge. It is the, the largest global network with now more than 2,500 members consisting of civil society, government, academia, but primarily private sector actors and then especially a large number of small and medium enterprises. Now we, we will be launching the results from our annual survey of which we have been uh, starting to communicate a bit more uh, in recent weeks at the SC4 forum at the start of April, but here's already a, a quick sneak peek which, which does show that um, healthcare is an important end use for the off-grid products that are being sold. Um, 
the potential impacts of energy on, on health service delivery include the, the list you see on the screen right now, ranging from increased and improved medical services to more operational and administrative aspects of healthcare, such as, for example, keeping patient records or, or uh, inventories for, for medical supplies. However, in a recent study across 11 sub-Saharan African countries for which data was available, uh, an estimated 26% of health facilities did not have any access to electricity and similarly only one in three hospitals um, was deemed to have reliable electricity provision which means without any major outages in the week prior to the visit. Now together with WHO and UN Women, UNF coordinates a multi-stakeholder partnership in support of SE for All called Energy for Women and Children's Health. Under the umbrella of this partnership, UNF has carried out several activities in this space, ranging from carrying out uh, energy needs assessments in four countries in now more than 300 healthcare facilities, to currently managing a health facility electrification project in collaboration with the organization, the Solar Electric Light Fund, in Ghana and Uganda. And in this project, we're also uh, we're, we're mirroring that with a an impact assessment on the health side to try and and uh, uncover some of the linkages between delivering energy interventions on the one hand and on the on the other hand, uh, seeing improvements in uh, in health outcomes. We will of course talk more about about these uh, these activities in future webinars. But today, this webinar will explore uh, different approaches to delivering energy to health facilities in resource-constrained environments. It is part of a, of a series and follows on an earlier webinar organized in July of 2016, uh, where we introduced some of the main barriers in the energy health nexus. But in the next few months and years, we expect to organize several more webinars, each with a specific sub-theme relevant to powering health facilities. Today, we talk more about the design stage as we discuss different approaches to delivering sustainable energy solutions in the health sector with representatives of WeCare Solar, Solar Kiosk, and then uh, the next speaker from Adam Smith International's Solar Nigeria program. We encourage everyone to join the conversation. You have the opportunity, as Sean already mentioned, to ask questions, um, most of which hopefully we will be able to already address today. You can also join the conversation on Twitter using the hashtags PNWebinar and hashtag PoweringHealthcare. Now, without further ado, I would like to pass the controls to Tinian to talk more about the Solar Nigeria program. Good day, everyone. Good day, everyone. My presentation today will be focusing on the Lego Solar Project with emphasis on the Ekpe Clinic. Uh, the Lego Solar Project is Nigeria's largest solar project implemented to date, really. Um, with basic aim of improving healthcare, enhancing education while, while reducing CO2 emissions. Um, this project was done in collaboration with um, the Lagos State Government of Nigeria and uh, the UK DFID, where both parties contributed £50 million each to achieve the project. Um, the Lagos State Electricity Board helped implement the project on behalf of the Lagos State Government and Solar Nigeria, for which I am speaking, helped implement the project on behalf of UK DFID. Um, the project, project is completed and has an approximate installed capacity of solar PV panels of about uh, 5 megawatts, which makes up for about 10% of the total power generated by Lagos State Government in Nigeria today. Um, like I said, the project has been completed and it has a total of 172 public, it has solar installed in 172 public secondary schools and 11 primary health centers or clinics. But for the purpose of today's discussion, I'll be focusing on, on, the, on the clinics. This project commenced in um, September of 2014 and was completed in February of, of 20, 2016. Now let's take a closer look at um, the approaches to actually implement 
this particular project. We, we, we took six major steps. One was to identify the opportunity and partner with um, a suitable partner, in this case, UK DFID partnering with Lagos State Government. Counterpart funding was, was, um, was made available by both parties. Um, agreements were put in place as to how to go about executing the project and uh, agreements like operations and maintenance agreements were also drafted to aid sustainability of, of the project. Then we went to the next step which involved the actual site selection um, and um, energy audits. A total of 615 Lagos secondary schools and 85 clinics were audited and they were audited for their energy needs, the need for 24-hour electricity, especially for the clinics, available space in these, these facilities, population size in, in the location, um, equipment that was present and, and needed electricity to power, um, access roads to, to the site, um, adequate security, so, so on and so forth basically. Then we moved on to the actual system design uh, and then we, the, the, the design was done in three phases. We had the design for the civil works which involved all the, the design of the support structure for the solar PV panels and the cabins that will house the inverters and charge controllers and batteries. Then we also had a design for the electrical retrofit which involved designs to improve the energy efficiency of the selected sites before the solar PV units were installed. Then we had the actual solar PV unit design which involved the calculations for all the um, number of inverters, charge controllers, batteries, solar PV units for each particular site. Procurement, shipping and asset management was done by um, Crown agents as contracted by DFID. They procured all the equipment shipped over to sites and then the actual implementation of this project was handled by the Lagos State Electricity Board where local technicians from, from the state were trained by original equipment manufacturers and um, deployed to each particular site for the project to be executed. Now, post-installation gave rise to the operations and maintenance uh, um, agreements to go into effect. Um, remote monitoring device, devices that were previously installed were activated so that the systems can be monitored um, remotely by these technicians and maintained. Further training took place such that um, technicians now know how to maintain the systems from simple things like cleaning systems to checking battery levels and things like that. Then Solar Nigeria now carries out uh, a biannual beneficiary monitoring exercise to help check the, the, the benefits of these systems, um, the, the use of these systems to beneficiaries and how it has improved health and education outcomes. Now, um, at this point, I think it will be important to note that uh, Lagos State Government has maintained a yearly recurring budget for the operations and maintenance of the systems till date to ensure that the systems are, are sustainable. Now, because we're talking about healthcare, using solar to improve healthcare systems, I'll be talking particularly about the EPE clinic, which happens to be the very first site that was completed in the Lagos Solar Project and was completed in December of 2014. Um, the EPE clinic presently employs about 24 staff and it's, it's, it, it, record, it, it records an average of about 6,000 patients, which includes mothers for antenatal care. Uh, in the past, this facility, which has um, a laboratory, um, a cold storage unit, really did not enjoy these equipment because the EPEC community had only about two hours of electrical power from the grid every day and in some cases when the grid is really low that could be worse. The um, women who use this facility especially for delivery had to come with uh, kerosene lanterns or candles and in some cases they even had to come with cans of diesel to power the facilities generator just to give birth. Now the solar system unit that is installed is a 72 kilowatt peak um, capacity unit which consists of about 240 solar panels of 300 watts each. Now the impact of this solar system installation, the, the solar unit, is it has greatly impacted uh, nighttime delivery especially. 
um, prior to the installation of the solar PV, we the, the, the facility rather um, recorded about an average of 12 babies born every night, uh, 12 babies born monthly rather, and um, from the first beneficiary monitoring exercise that we carried out in April of 2015, that average improved to about 30 babies delivered at night, and um, as of December of last year, that improved improved to 114 babies delivered at night. Um, there's also been a 20% increase in the number of new patients that have visited the facility. There's been significant increase in drug and vaccine storage. In the cold storage unit has grossly improved. It, it, um, to emphasize this, there's even a case where the general hospital had to move its fridges to the primary health center to in, in, increase the storage of vaccines and drugs at this, at this site. Um, fuel purchase, which used to average about $200 monthly in this particular clinic, has now been reduced to zero because the facility is powered 24 hours by, by solar. And uh, we also have um, CO2 emissions that have also been reduced to, to zero. Thank you. Great, thank you, Tinian. Um, and we'll now turn to Virginia for her presentation. Great, thank you, Sean. So I'll start with a, a welcome from, from Solar Kiosk. Uh, we're actually um, delivering the webinar from our headquarters in Berlin. And I'll start off with just a, a little introduction on Solar Kiosk and then focus on the um, Connected Solar Clinic solution that we recently deployed in Jordan. So Solar Kiosk, hold on a minute, it's not letting me move the page. There we go. Um, solar Kiosk um, really started out with a model to bring um, solar energy um, as well as quality goods to last mile communities in Africa. And, and we really call ourselves the energy and connectivity gateway and last mile distribution network for underserved communities. And it's our e-hub, which is the silver structure you see there that we use as a platform um, to offer renewable energy products and services, such as phone charging and other things, um, consumer goods, connectivity, such as, as Wi-Fi connectivity, uh, financial inclusion projects, as well as our solutions for education, and then healthcare, which I'll, I'll come on to, and really all with a goal to enable and empower communities. And as I mentioned, we really started our focus in Africa but we've expanded out to um, Southeast Asia and recently um, in the Middle East and Jordan. So uh, Solar Kiosk has a, a range of energy infrastructure solutions. As I mentioned, we have our eHub, which is what we use to run our retail and service business that we, we run across really six countries in, in Africa. And each of these units, um, they have between one kilowatt peak of power on the single structure itself, and then a canopy that can add an additional kilowatt peak of power, enabling two kilowatt peaks of power. And here we can power a, a 240 liter refrigerator, phone charging, a TV, a fan, lights, internally ex and externally as well as other businesses. And now we really have an approach to, to connect others in the community and give them energy services, other businesses, so that they can, can set up around the kiosk. And we create a hub of activity um, as well as potentially for productive use in communities. From the eHub, we've evolved a couple of different infrastructure um, with automated, with atomic energy solutions that we've deployed um, as a clinic and then also as a school. Um, so our clinic solution, which I'll go into detail, really is 
is to provide both the infrastructure as well as the energy services to deliver healthcare um, either off-grid or in, in displacement settings. Um, the Connected Solar School, it's here can deliver both energy as well as connectivity to really enhance the ability to deliver both education as well as vocational training and other aspects. We've also deployed our, our school units in, um, in Jordan in a refugee camp there, um, working with, with a couple of humanitarian partners to really increase the, the type of education and innovation opportunities they can offer the students. So if we look at, at Solar Kiosk in, in general, um, we were founded in 2012 here in Berlin, as I mentioned. We have over 175 of the EHAB or kiosk type units in our, in our own operations. Um, and we've worked with various partners to, to deliver 20 different um, third party solutions to across countries outside of our core network. As I mentioned, we have the school and the clinic that we've most recently implemented as demonstrations of our, of our infrastructure um, with autonomous energy. So if I focus on the clinic, which is really the subject of, of today's discussion, these are images from the recent inauguration of the clinic in Jordan. This is actually an eight kilowatt peak structure, as you can see by the considerable number of, of panel, panels on the canopies. Um, and this 8 kilowatt peak was needed so that we could control the temperature inside the clinic. Of course, in Jordan, the temperature ranges is much greater than in Africa. So we needed to include um, air conditioning and heating system to ensure that it would be optimal temperature for the medical equipment as well as for the patients. So this project was, was really made possible through our partners and really this this project was, was very complex because it involved a lot of different partners, um, but I think that also enabled it to succeed. Um, so we worked primarily with Siemens Stiftung, who was the donor for the clinic. Um, we worked with a couple of, of Siemens healthcare partners for the equipment inside the clinic, which I'll come on to. And most importantly, we worked with the Ministry of Health in Jordan, who now owns and, and operates the clinic in Jordan. And it was very important to, to involve these various partners um, throughout various stages of design and, of course, the, the overall implementation and long-term use of the clinic. So inside the clinic, we have, in addition to a refrigerator, which is possible in, in all our solutions, we have a urine analysis, a hematology lab, uh, an ultrasound device, as well as um, a Wi-Fi system that can be used both by the, the doctors and medical personnel for a telecommuting or remote um, health analysis, connecting with hospitals and clinics and other areas for diagnostic activity. Um, it is also this connectivity that allows us to monitor the energy production and energy usage to make sure that everything is, is going well inside the clinic. Um, so that connectivity, I think, is really essential um, and really enhances what can, can happen inside the clinic. So that is an insight into, into Solar Kiosk and a little bit about our clinic. And finally, this is, this is another picture of another connected e-hub that we have in, in one of our countries. So we're really coupling our infrastructure and energy solutions also now with connectivity solutions. Great, thank you, Virginia. Uh, we'll um, turn things now over to Laura for her presentation. Just trying to get the full screen up. Can you see my screen with, with or without the go to webinar control panel? Yes, we can see just the slides. We don't see the panel. Okay, great. 
Well, he hello, everybody. My name is Dr. Laura Spatchel, and I'm the Executive Director of We Care Solar. We started working in the realm of energy for healthcare in about 2009 um, and incorporated in 2010. And the focus of our work is actually uh, specifically maternal and child health. So we are most interested in trying to find a scalable solution to stem the tide of um, pregnancy and delivery-related deaths. And around the world, about 303 women die every year from pregnancy-related complications. And most of those complications are things that are actually quite treatable, things like bleeding, infection, a condition that's related to high blood pressure in pregnancy called eclampsia, obstructed labor, which means the baby is too big, and also unsafe abortion. And in sub-Saharan Africa, young women face a 1 in 38 chance of dying from a complication of pregnancy. And when I started this work, that number was much higher. In 2008, I was invited to spend time as an obstetrician just observing care in a hospital in northern Nigeria. And I spent two weeks, about 10 to 14 hours a day, just watching what was happening in this room, labor and delivery, as well as in this room, which was the surgical ward. And one of the things that struck me was that the hospital, which was serving a city of 1.5 million people, did not have electricity for 12 hours of each day. So this operating theater, for example, could not use its overhead lights, its suction machine, its cautery devices, and instead relied on the um, ambient light from windows in order to perform C-sections. Uh, there were other complications from not having diagnostic equipment and not having communication equipment so that when a woman needed to have an emergency procedure like this one, there was no way to even reach out quickly to health providers and rather a hospital messenger was sent to track down a doctor that might be on call to help when emergencies arose. And at night, this was the only light that was available. Uh, there were other options, actually, which were candles, but there was no good source of light. And this is the room that is showing the maternity ward, which has 12 mothers and babies behind this particular midwife. In an effort to try and help this first hospital, we designed a standalone solar electric system that would target the operating room, delivery room, the labor ward, and also the um, laboratory to bring in a blood bank refrigerator, um, we designed it to be 12 volt DC primarily to have high storage to be very easy to maintain. The operating room went from looking like this to this and we found that the health providers actually liked LED lights more than the original fluorescent lights we had um, thought of in the design and we realized this needed very little power. This is only 15 watts to provide the lighting for the operating theater. And we saw that over the next year, when the hospital now had a blood bank and lighting for these crucial areas, the maternal deaths in the hospital went down by 70%, and the hospital was no longer turning patients away. After that one experience, many surrounding health clinics came to us and said, why are you only helping the big hospital? We are also delivering babies in the dark. And that was the moment where we realized we needed to come up with something that was going to be more cost effective and able to scale. And at first we hand designed small portable solar electric kits that we fit inside of suitcases that had many of the elements of the original system. Everything was just made much smaller. Over time demand for these continued to grow and we started to assemble them in a backyard assembly line but finally, we ended up working with a um, factory to actually produce these at scale um, to the point that we have now distributed more than 2,200 of these um, solar electric kits around the world. So these are called solar suitcases, and they include solar panels, of course, batteries for storage. We now use lithium ferrous phosphate batteries, a charge controller. And we have the end appliances included. We have uh, either two or four um, medically designed lights that actually are designed to be very sturdy to direct lights towards procedure 
and also to have good color rendition in the event of the need to use the lights for surgery. The solar suitcase also includes a fetal Doppler to listen to a baby's heartbeat. It includes LED headlamps that can be recharged from the system as well as phone charging equipment. And in specialized projects, we're also able to use the device to power other things such as computers for medical records as well as for ultrasound when that's needed by changing the size of the panels that go with the system and the size of the battery. I'm sorry, I'm just having trouble changing the slide. So with the solar suitcase, now midwives do have the light that they need to perform uh, procedures at night. As I mentioned, the lights are very effective also for surgery by putting an articulating gooseneck arm. We're able to use a lot of the overhead uh, surgical lighting equipment that lays dormant in many countries. This is a picture from Uganda. We also feel that the phone charging is an essential element of uh, providing care to first-line health centers that need to call when there's emergencies and also to summon ambulances when patients need to be referred. And we include a fetal Doppler, which is a device to listen to a baby's heartbeat to detect whether a baby might be in distress or not. Now, none of these would work without having an education system to train the midwives how to use the equipment effectively. And as we scaled, we realized that women needed to do more than just train people to use them. They needed to get on the roof and do the installation. To that end, we ended up developing a brigade of female solar ambassadors that were trained to lead train the trainer programs in countries around the world. Uh, this was done through a six-week online course followed by a one-week in-person course to prepare these women, and they have now subsequently had follow-up training courses as our equipment has changed and our organization has grown. At our training sessions, we are often teaching people about solar electricity for the first time. We call upon partners from UN agencies, NGOs, as well as uh, local district health technicians to become our solar installers. Sometimes this is the first time they've ever used power tools. They may never have been on a roof before. So we teach a lot of safety skills. And when the course is over, um, we go to several health facilities and actually do full installations, having them train health workers to use the equipment, do all the installations before they have a graduation. Key to our model is that we had a product that was designed in the field that incorporated a lot of user feedback, and we constantly get additional feedback to try and change and improve our basic solar suitcase. It's important for us to select appropriate facilities and do audits, as others have mentioned, and we then need to train people on how to use the um, equipment. But as we've grown, the only way we've been able to reach and scale to many regions of the world is to work with partners. And these partners, as mentioned, are UN agencies. They are NGOs like Save the Children, CARE, JAPIGO. Um, and they are Ministry of Health partners, both at the federal level and at the local level. And we rely on them to help us select appropriate facilities to actually conduct the installations, to maintain the equipment and service it over time, and to do research um, activities with us so we can monitor and evaluate our programs. Here's an example of some of the partners that we've used in different countries. Most of these activities have been in Africa but we've also done activities in Nepal with One Heart Worldwide and in the Philippines with Stiftung Solar Energy Foundation. So for a map of where we've been working, the larger partnerships are the ones where the countries are outlined in yellow and the orange countries are showing where we may have um, been able to donate some solar suitcases, but there's not really an established program the way there are in these other countries. To date, we've equipped about 2,400 health centers with solar suitcases. We've trained more than 9,000 people to be you know, our <clears throat> technicians and our users on the ground. And we estimate that we have served about 900,000 deliveries. So that's mothers and infants um, that have benefited from having health 
care that with light. And we saw a lot of the same kinds of findings that Solar Nigeria saw, that when you provide light at night, you're much more likely to have utilization of the clinics. You're also more likely to improve healthcare worker morale. We could not do this without fantastic partners. This is a picture of partnerships that started in 2011 in Liberia. This week, I'm going back to Liberia, actually tomorrow, and we're going to be launching a program where we intend to ensure that every health center doing primary care in the country has a reliable source of light or a solar suitcase. So we're actually bringing hundreds of solar suitcases to that country right now to try and electrify all the uh, areas. Two very brief additions. Um, the fact that this is a suitcase means that it can either be used as a portable device, as we've used it sometimes, for example, in the Ebola crisis, it needed to be used with tents. And as another example of that, after the earthquake in Nepal, we had this as a portable device used inside tents, but that yellow cabinet also becomes a permanent fixture that can be uh, mounted to the wall. In, like, in Nepal, in this picture, there were more than 130 of these that went in and 130 more are coming. Uh, and this was the first baby that was born with solar lights in Nepal. And I'll stop there. Thank you very much for the presentation. Um, I'd like to turn things over again now to Luke, who is going to lead a panel discussion. Great. Thank you so much, Laura and Virginia and Tinian for your presentations. Also, thank you for, for keeping it down. I know we could talk about this for, for days, and I think we, we will, but just not today. We will talk about it for days over the next couple of months and years in future webinars and future conversations and in, in events, um, because this is, this is a very important topic. And, and, and clearly, we, we're not done speaking about this. Uh, at this point. I think in future webinars we will definitely delve in deeper on um, on the impact, on the results, on the outcome of, of these types of interventions and why they matter so much. Uh, but today we would like to take a couple of steps back and really focus more on what is important when you are considering these types of interventions? Why, you know, what, what are certain aspects that you need to take into consideration because you're working in a, in a specific environment, be it more in a humanitarian setting uh, in, in, in Jordan, for example, with solar kiosk, or whether this is just a public health facility in a very rural area where, where you're not even replacing anything, you're bringing something completely new. Um, so. So with that, that being said, I would like to ask, ask the first question um, to, um, to our panelists uh, revolving stakeholder engagement and especially the, on, on the public side, uh, but not limited, but, but we know that the facilities and the, the, the solutions that, that all three of you have presented, there's an element of, of public uh, ownership involved uh, or public management because, because you are talking about public health facilities and and I would like to hear from you and, and maybe Tinian we can start with you because you clearly mentioned Lagos State Government um, not only as a as an active participant but even as a co-funder in this project um, to get a little bit of, of uh, information from you in terms of how did that relationship work? How is it approached um, both at the design stage and the implementation stage and uh, and, and from you um, also, what is what, what is your opinion in terms of the appropriate level of, of involvement, of stakeholder engagement, not only at the central level, but also at, at the district level or at the local level? Um, Tinian, over to you. Thanks, Luke. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. We can. Okay, beautiful. Um, just like you mentioned, really, uh, one of the key aspects that we considered, especially while designing this project, we uh, was we wanted something that would be sustainable. These are large systems that uh, will will be deployed over time uh, and is expected to run year in and year out. So there was no way we could do this without um, public ownership, public management of the system. So that's why, in the case of Lagos State Government, we got the um, counterpart funding from the government and their buy-in to support the operations and, and maintenance. Um, while this project was being designed at the very early stages, 
the issue of operational maintenance was hammered on so strongly because we knew that that was the only way we can keep this project going. Uh, what the Lagos State Electricity Board is doing at the moment is to uh, carve out a part of the um, Energy Commission, which is a part of the state, and they, they have a budget for the maintenance of these systems where they have now contracted local technicians that have been trained on how to manage the systems going forward. Now, the Electricity Board has decided to take it a step further than that. They are also looking at ways in which private organizations can take this up as a business and uh, the, the state can get to now pay in thrift for the maintenance of these services even while they expand the um, solar facility to other primary health centers that have not that, that don't yet have solar PV installed in them. So um, sustainability is, is like the bedrock of, of this kind of an installation. So public ownership is, is always key. Thank you, Tinian. Virginia, any, any thoughts or any comments in terms of your experiences in Jordan and getting the Ministry of Health involved and engaged and, and how, how did that process work? Were there any particular challenges in, uh, in, in that setup? Yes, Luke, I think, um, I mean, our project was, was focused on serving really migrating populations coming through Jordan as well as as local Jordanians. So in this case, we, we sought out to work with the, the Ministry of Health um, rather than a particular humanitarian um, organization uh, because of, of really the, the dual purpose of, of the center, really to help serve the, the overflow of patients um, using the Jordanian health system. Um, but I think it, it definitely has it's, it's challenges as it does with, with um, working with any organization that um, has a lot on its plate and that the response time um, is not always as, as quick as you would like and you aren't able to move things along as, as fast as you, as you hope. But I think the, the key thing is, is to find a, a champion inside of, of, of an organization, really any organization that can can be your, your focal communication point, um, but it's very important for them to be involved in the original design phase um, and really kind of agreeing step by step that you're moving in the right direction. Of course, there's a lot of hierarchy when you're dealing, as we know, with, with governmental institutions, and I think you need to, to understand that and respect that and, and work through those processes. I think the, one of the key things for us was that we were lucky to have um, our Siemens partners on the ground in Jordan that could really help us by physically going to the Ministry of Health and talking with them, getting their feedback, getting their signature on documents, and, and that was critical to the success of the project. And I think that's something that, that really having, having that assistance on the ground is, is key. <laughs> Great. I, I'm, I'm, I wrote down the word champion because I think it's something that, that, is, that is indeed crucial, um, also talking from, from UNF's experiences and, and the building of the relationship with, with those public stakeholders, with the public partners as being key. Laura, you mentioned the, the project rollout in Liberia, um, which, which I assume is also in a, in a partnership with the Ministry of Health. Any any added comments on on this uh, on the stakeholder engagement from from Liberia? Yeah, so I would echo a number of things that Virginia said. In fact, I had on my own notes the idea of a champion. I think that some of the challenges that have been involved is that um, not so far in Liberia, but in other countries we've worked in, there's been quite a bit of turnover, and so sometimes you can feel like you've made quite a bit of progress with a group of people. And then there's a change, people are now gone, and it's almost like you're starting at the beginning again. So that is very difficult, and it means that you'll do better if you actually have engaged a number of people rather than just one, um, where your history is going to go out the window when that person is transferred. Um, for us, because we're doing projects that 
um, involve many, many health facilities and we're trying to penetrate deep into countries, we work in addition to the federal ministry with the district ministries. And those are the ones that we really need buy-in for, for sustainability of the program so they can put things like maintenance and replacement of batteries into the budgets that they are asking for. These are also the people that are helping us with implementation. So they need to be releasing some of their staff to get trained by us and to work with us. And wherever we can try and piggyback onto existing structures, um, we feel like this strengthens our program. So for example, if the cold technicians in the district are the ones that are visiting health centers most regularly and have technical skills, those cold technicians are perfect for learning how to do installations and maintenance of a solar suitcase and they already have reasons to go to a clinic so that will help with follow-up and, and maintenance. The other thing we feel is that it's important to have the health workers and the community feel a sense of ownership and to feel empowered by this uh, for, ex for um, the fact that this is going to be their equipment and sometimes it's a bit tricky in the government because the health workers are not the owners. So we have found where we've put the, these into private health centers, people will set, take a sense of personal ownership right off the bat. But we actually need to work uh, with the health workers, with a handover ceremony, with giving them a certificate after they've learned to use it, with having them feel a sense of ownership so that they'll both know how to use it uh, properly, but also notify us if there's any things that need to be repaired or fixed. Um, so those, I would say, would be my most, the highest level points to share on this question. Perfect. And that leads us to, to the next one as well. But just, by the way, for, for our listeners as well, please feel free to ask questions in the chat box, uh, and we will try to address as many as possible after this moderated conversation. Um, yeah, so following on what, on what Laura said, it's uh, maybe, Virginia, maybe you can, you can start this off. Um, what are some of the, the other project components that you, from the beginning, uh, highlighted as, as, as mark, or highlighted as being crucial for, for the success or for guaranteeing success and for minimizing risks? And so Laura already mentioned the, you know, it's, it's much more about, uh, it's, it's much more than just dropping a, a solar energy solution or an energy solution at the clinic and then, and then leaving. There's a whole, uh, support services side around it, there's a softer side around it in terms of community mobilization, in terms of ownership and training. And so I just want to get a sense from you whether, um, you know, what, what type of project components or, or, or activities that you highlighted as being key, especially given that, you know, this is, this is the first of this type of clinic and most of the work that Solar Kiosk has done is more on the, uh, you know, more on the, the commercial side in terms of using these, these kiosks for, for commercial purposes. Virginia? Sure, Luke. I think the, the key element, I would say, at the very beginning um, is, is to size the, the system and the infrastructure properly. Um, actually, in our original design, we hadn't considered um, the air conditioning and, and heating aspect, but in our discussions with the Ministry of Health, it became um, clear that that was, that was essential, given the conditions in Jordan, particularly um, to ensure the equipment worked properly. So then we actually changed to the clinic and enhanced it to be able to offer more energy. <coughs> Excuse me. I think. One of the other um, <coughs> big aspects is training. <coughs> so training how to take care of the clinic in terms of cleaning the solar panels as well as <coughs> excuse me, the interface of the equipment with the electrical system. And those are key aspects as well to ensure that the clinic, you know, re you really get the 15-year life out of the clinic as it's built. Great. Tinian, any, any input here in terms of how your, your clinic system, or, or I, would, I would actually say hospital system, given the sizes that you, that you mentioned, how they differ from, from the other interventions you've done, for example, the schools? Um, in terms of how they differ, for the schools, we do not necessarily provide 24-hour power 
for the entire school. What we do is we provide 12-hour intervention for the academic and academic parts of the schools and the classrooms, which really runs for just the daytime. And then for schools that have um, boarding facilities attached, they also have solar power that runs throughout the night. Well, for the clinics, it's a 24-hour power solution round the clock for, for, for the clinics. Um, just to add to what Virginia also mentioned, that's a crucial part of the project really, is for us it's really a proper, carrying out a proper audit of each facility so we can write size and then adequately anticipate what loads will be added in the future. But um, added to that, another crucial part for us has all also been um, communal ownership. We've been able to replicate this project in two other locations in Nigeria. One is in Kaduna State, where we have deployed um, 34 solar for to power 34 clinics, which was just completed as um, um, a few weeks ago. And then we've also extended this to uh, deploy solar PV in three hospitals in the Boko Haram affected northeastern in Nigeria. Um, but to get this moving, we have realized that involving the community to aid security of the systems, to optimize the operations of the systems, to ensure that there's maintenance going forward, um, we, we, we always get the local community involved from the get-go. Thank you for that. Uh, a little bit linked to this, um, but but going a little, delving a little bit deeper, and and uh, maybe Laura, you can kick this one off. Are there any elements or preconditions, be it external or internal, which you say for We Care Solar, this needs to be in place before we will consider an intervention, be it you know government buy-in or or a certain level of staffing at the health facility or a certain level of 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 need or services that are being offered. Uh, yes, absolutely. Um, first of all, before we work in a country, we really want to choose countries that have appropriate need. And as an organization focusing on maternal health care, we tend to select countries that have high rates of maternal and newborn mortality, as well as uh, big issues with energy poverty. Um, so there's a selection that's even starts at the level of a country for us, and we want to have a government that also um, looks like they could be a good partner with us. Are they interested in working with us on this issue? Um, as opposed to the approach that both of the other speakers talked about where you do a large energy audit and size your system, our system is more of a standardized system that is trying to reach many, many health centers over a short period of time. So we might put in 100 solar suitcases and clinics within a couple of months. So for us, the selection process is, can we find the appropriate type of health facility where the amount of electricity that we have to offer can be transformative? So we look for places that have no electricity whatsoever or who have very unreliable electricity the health center needs to be, uh, typically we like it to be one that has a one-story height because we're having not professionals doing these installations, but you know people that have been trained quite recently, so we don't want them to be on super high rooftops. We, of course, want it to be unobstructed sunlight on top of the roof. There needs to be health providers that are doing deliveries, and the clinic needs to be able to be open around the clock. So it's the selection of the clinic that becomes very, very important. We need to have an excellent partner to work with because we are only in the country in terms of meeting the partners and doing the trainings and providing support technically, but we're not there every single day. So selecting appropriate partners to work with, establishing very clear roles and responsibilities, and having a signed contract in place is important. And one that should be obvious, there needs to be funding in place. Sometimes we've started programs because We've led completely with our heart, assuming that we'll be able to find a funder to backfill. And we have found that to be very challenging. So now we do recommend that there's funding in place before we begin. We're also importing equipment into the country. So understanding issues with importation, knowing people in the government that can help us to get duty-free importation is also very, very important. 
Excellent. Thanks for that. That's, uh, that, that's very clear. Um, I would like to talk a little bit about, about the lessons learned and how they shape. So lessons learned from previous interventions, be it similar interventions or be it interventions in, in, in another sector, and how they've shaped your, your current interventions. Um, perhaps, Virginia, you want, to, you want to kick this one off? Sure, well, as I mentioned, you know, the our solution is, is an infrastructure and energy solution. So I think, um, again, the learnings that we had in the field with, with our solution, the eHub, really as a, as a retail outlet, you know, helped us to then be able to evolve that into solutions like the clinic, and, and the school. And really the unique thing about our design is that it's modular. So in Jordan, we, the solution is actually two kiosks, so to speak, put together with a series of canopies. But it could have been um, additional kiosks to, to allow for additional rooms. So I think that, that really we owe a bit to the, to the original design of our of our eHub solution that it is applicable um, to many different types of, of use cases. Um, so I think there, that's very interesting. I think also, um, as I think, uh, you know, the, the energy side is, is really um, built to, to have the machine-to-machine -machine capability and enable different types of, of appliances. Um, so I think, again, it's something where, you know, really sitting and working with, with a partner who will actually be operating the solution is, is key to understand what types of equipment they are familiar with to be able to use and also, you know, to be able to, to uphold over time. So I think it's it's really the original design of our solution that allows it to lend itself, but we continue to evolve it very much based on our experience in the field. You know, moving to a different um, type of, of battery, for instance, or also to um, a different size inverter or different systems that allow for connectivity. Uh, so I think it's, it's something that I think any good design will continue to evolve. Um, the more you use it, and as technology evolves as well. Dinian, do you have anything anything to add to that in terms of of how lessons learned have shaped your your current intervention, especially the one on uh, at the hospitals and clinics? Okay, um, this being our first project of this kind, we have rather taken from the lessons learned from this and improved on future designs like in the other two projects I mentioned um, in collaboration with the Kaduna State Government and the Bonu State Government. Um, one of the, what we have done basically is um, we have been able to improve contracting um, such that we, we now contract um, to, we contract better now so that we can also improve project timeline, the, the timeline of project delivery. Um, we've also um, improved the technology behind the systems. We've switched from the lead acid battery types to the lithium ion battery types in our future projects. Uh, we've been able to also ensure that there is a strong government buy-in prior to um, interventions. Um, we, we want a situation where uh, governments actually have signed agreements that can transcend from one administration to to the next really so these systems can actually um, stand the test of time and operational and maintenance contracts can can be in place irrespective of a change in power so ba basically that's those are the lessons learned that we have applied in in future projects going forward Excellent. I, I want to ask one more question, but Laura, perhaps you want to chime in as well on, on lessons learned. And I, I know you have a, a product, and we, we've seen from your slideshow that your product has evolved somewhat, but, but in essence it's the same, it's the same product with, with the same goal in mind. But, but clearly there's, a, there's much more to it than, than just a prod, product in terms of the training and, and how it's being delivered. Any anything you want to add at this point on uh, on lessons learned and, and how your approach has potentially changed? 
Well, I think our approach has changed from one where literally I would personally go and bring a handful of solar suitcases to a few people to help me put them in to one where we now can ship 100 or 150 solar suitcases to an implementation partner and then we need to do the logistics and management about how to do a selection of health centers over a full district or two districts and engage a lot of other stakeholders. Um, so I would say that some of the lessons learned have had to do with how to work effectively with partners, especially when we're based in the United States and working with people on other sides of the world, um, how to create standardization in a lot of our operating principles. We now have these sheets that lay out very clear roles and responsibilities for ourselves and our partners to have the expectations clearly understood before we get going. Um, very often our partners will do some element of cost sharing um, on the programs. That needs to be very much articulated so people don't have misunderstandings later. Uh, we work with our partners at the end of a program to understand what worked well and what things we'd want to change for the future. So we try and learn from that. And we've actually done now two separate reviews of partnerships. We've done a total of 40 partnerships now. And we did a lessons learned after the first 25, and then we applied them to the next 20 or so. And then we're now looking again to say, what can we learn from this? Um, we find that in terms of working with partners, it's important to find partners that do have the capacity to take on a large project like this, that can uh, communicate in a timely fashion, that are open to the um, challenges that can happen along the way and, and able to improvise when needed that there are going to be partners that stay in that area for an ongoing presence, that they both know the place historically, but that they'll be continuing there for the duration and beyond of the project. Um, and we have found that as far as our interest in trying to boost maternal child health, it seems easiest for us to work with healthcare partners because they are the mo most adept at identifying which health centers need help. They can help us train people on using the fetal Doppler. Um, they can help us collect the kind of stories we need about health workers and how these things have impacted their lives. So we are sometimes using solar um, companies as technical support for the program, but as far as the large implementing partners, they tend to be maternal child health uh, oriented as well. Perfect. Thank you for that. Um, so we, we started this, this conversation talking about stakeholder engagement. So for for my last question and after this question after we've we've answered this then we will we'll open it up uh, and and Sean will will lead us through the Q&A so I, I want to bring it back full circle on the stakeholder engagement but a little bit wider than your your actual intervention or your actual project um, and talk a bit about the coordination between stakeholders between actors in this space be it public be it private um, with, you know, if, if I want to look at it positively to identify and explore synergies, but from a negative point of view to at least avoid duplication because, because I, I think we all know there is always a risk of, uh, of duplicating efforts uh, because of a lack of coordination, because of a lack of information sharing. Um, just to give you one example to, to, and then I will open it up to to the three of you. Um, in the project that we are currently managing in, in Ghana and Uganda on health facility electrification, we organized a, a multi-stakeholder meeting, an, an inception meeting, which we opened up to both health organizations as well as energy uh, actors and then both public and private civil society, etc. And in both Ghana and in Uganda during that inception meeting, um, already a, uh, a, a potential risk of duplication was was identified purely because you know you may be coordinating with different public agencies one might focus more centrally the other one more on the district level and so i think that's my question to you as in what is what is your current level of coordination um, within the sector in the countries that you're working in or in the regions that you're working in is it sufficient what would you expect to see um, especially at that level but p please feel free to also uh, add in international coordination and exchange of information and you know learning from learning from each other um, maybe Tinian you want to you want to start this one okay um, 
I would use the particular example of the intervention we're carrying out in the Northeast as an example here because we are heavily involved in a lot of information sharing and coordination to achieve this. The location is still very sensitive security-wise. There are a lot of sporadic terrorist attacks still going on. So we, um, for, for the purpose of even carrying out the installation and moving goods to site, we have found ourselves that we had to coordinate with other international donors, the um, UNICEF, UNDP, um, who, who happen to be part of reconstruction of, for, for this particular state. Uh, we have also been in touch with um, other international organizations like the International Red Cross to um, find out how exactly and which locations exactly uh, are they supporting in terms of the internally displaced persons that need improved health care. So we, we, we also get involved with um, um, coordination meetings with um, state security, um, federal security because of the sensitivity of this location. So it's not something we, we can avoid. Um, to, to what we do basically is we have monthly coordination meetings amongst these different partners to keep everyone abreast of what we are, um, the, the level of involvement or the stages in which the project has, has gotten up to. Um, we also try to be sensitive about how we move goods and personnel to these locations and try to inform each other on, on what exactly is happening on site at a particular point in time. So it's not something we can particularly avoid to make, make this happen. Virginia, any information in terms of coordination in, in Jordan or, or uh, any exchanges you've had with other stakeholders that helped shape your intervention? I think actually I would say it kind of once our intervention was there, um, there was a lot of interest from many different players in the clean energy space in Jordan. Um, I think that um, you know, we were we were lucky that at, at the inauguration of, of the clinic, we were able to attract the interests of, of various um, potential technical partners as well as others in the um, you know renewable field that are are also working um, in a humanitarian and development context. So I actually found that um, you know by Putting the clinic on the ground, it really has has opened a lot of doors for potential collaboration in the future. Um, but I, what I'll also say, in general, I think that there's a lot of of forums in terms of of clean energy and solar. But I think something that that really um, could help a lot of us in this space is to work a little bit with um, on policy with various governments, particularly for, for duties and taxes paid on bringing solar uh, and solar components into various countries. I think this can be an inhibitor to, to really allowing the, the scalability of, of solar energy and I think it's something that, that we've seen in countries that have, have you know, been <laughs> allowed to be duty free and tax free um, uh, implication is has really been powerful. So I would say that that's something in general, kind of worldwide, that that we could all, as a as a greater group, um, work on to to ensure that it would be as cost effective as possible to to use solar as a renewable energy solution uh, across many different countries. Perfect. Thank you for that. Laura, I'm keeping you for last because you mentioned Liberia and in a previous life I, uh, I implemented a project in collaboration with the Department of Infrastructure within the Ministry of Health while simultaneously um, somebody was implementing a project with the Health Management Information Systems Unit at the Ministry of Health. And let's just say it took uh, uh, too long to figure out that we had a, quite a high risk of duplication. So Laura, any, and especially for you, because you, when you roll out, you roll out to hundreds of clinics. Um, 
of course, there's, it doesn't mean that if the solar suitcase is implemented in a clinic that uh, by default it shouldn't receive a solar system for, say, vaccination, water pumping, or, or other uh, energy-dependent services. But any, any information that you want to give in terms of, uh, of uh, coordination and how you manage that and how you share information, how you learn from others? Yeah, I, I think it's really an excellent question. Um, and you're right, when we work with hundreds of facilities, that means that's a lot of places that we're trying to both be doing assessments on. Um, and in countries that have received attention from a lot of other agencies, private NGOs, UN agencies, um, there tends to be, when there's not a crisis like a earthquake, there tends to be a real lack of coordination. And so it's very hard to go to any one place and know what's going on. And we have typically been working with the Ministry of Health to give us information, their assessments of which health centers have uh, different types of electricity and their levels of reliability. And I can tell you it's a bit of a coin toss as to when we go to a clinic whether that information is going to be correct or not. So for us now, the very first stage of our programs is to go and do an audit at each of the health centers that we are considering to be including in the program and realizing that we may have information that we can verify from the Ministry of Health or it may be completely different. Um, I didn't think of going to the Minister of Infrastructure. That's a really good idea, Luke. So probably we haven't even reached out to as many groups as we should. Um, on the other hand, because our unit is quite specialized, the lighting is designed specifically for medical procedures, it also can be an excellent adjunct system to other programs that are going on. So it doesn't mean necessarily that a clinic would be ineligible, but if there is, you know, reliable power and a recently installed solar electric system that covers the whole unit, we will usually not do an installation and keep moving on. So we actually train our installers to be aware of what is the right candidate clinic because sometimes our assessments may have been done three to six months before we do the actual installation in a given clinic. And so if there have been new interventions that have happened since that time, uh, it can be a problem. Right now in Liberia, we have a set of three implementation partners and the government, and we meet uh, every month to be discussing the program. So hopefully we are going to be avoiding you know, the possibility of having some very new initiative happening simultaneously. We also have the Ministry of Health having signed this at the highest level, and I'm going there next week to launch this program officially, and we've invited the Ministry of Lands, Mines, we've the, the Ministry of Gender, uh, the Finance Minister, and the Health Minister all together so that, you know, at least we've had at least one point in time when everybody should be informed of this program. Perfect. I think that's a, that's a perfect point to, to end this, this conversation. I want to thank all three of you, Virginia, Opinion, and Laura. Um, we talked about champions, we talked about coordinations and lessons learned, and with that, I would like to pass controls back to Sean. Thank you very much, all of you. Yeah, just thank you, everyone. I'd like to echo Luke, uh, Luke's thanks. Uh, great discussion. We do have a number of questions from the audience, so we'll use our remaining time to go through those. Um, so these are open to any of the panelists. Um, this first question that we received um, asks, so, so what are some of the technology challenges that we still face? Uh, we talked uh, quite a bit about some of the implementation and uh, policy and other challenges, um, but what issues do you find um, that you've run into, uh, particularly with the solar kiosk and We Care Solar um, technology-wise? Uh, what room for improvement is there? Perhaps we'll start with uh, Laura for this one. So for us, we spent the first few years looking at everything that could possibly fail in the solar suitcase and trying to improve it to make it stronger. And trying to think about the fact that these were going to be in very remote settings where there wasn't going to be the possibility of just buying a new part if it was needed. So for the example, one of the earliest solar suitcases, there were fuses there. We've now replaced those with circuit breakers. Um, we have 
for the devices that use batteries, we use rechargeable batteries and include a battery charger so that people don't have to buy replaceable batteries. We also, um, similar to the Solar Nigeria project, have moved from sealed lead acid batteries to um, lithium ferrous phosphate batteries. That's allowing our batteries to have a lifespan of at least five years, so it's decreasing the need for maintenance. Um, we developed lights. The lights that we first had were manufactured by another company. They said that these were ones that were used in bus stations and they were very durable for outdoor use. And we found that when we put them in Africa, it was so hot much of the time that the um, voltage was higher in the system than I think these lights, which were 12 volt DC lights, were used to. And a lot of them had LEDs that burned out. So we had to remanufacture the lights completely so they would have a large heat sink so that they would have um, the ability to accommodate the voltages that we were seeing in our 12 volt system. So I'd say there was a lot of you know, times where we had opportunities to learn from mistakes and make things better. I'd say one of the biggest challenges that all of us face in this field is the sustainability challenge, um, both in terms of recognizing when there's problems and then having mechanisms to solve those problems. So one of the technologies we are in the process of developing now is a remote monitor so that we can know at a given time whether or not there's issues, whether a battery is going to be needing replacement, if there's a light that has any problems. The suitcase is made to be pretty durable and it hasn't been co cost effective to try and send someone every few months to a health facility. The transport costs are so high for that. So if we can have some sort of an automated information system to let us know where we need to target help, we think that's going to be uh, in a, in a, an effective enhancement of our systems. Thanks, Laura. Uh, Virginia, any anything to add? Yeah, I would say like Laura, you know, our, our solution, um, we've continued to evolve it uh, in the field. We've had our, our eHub solution in the field for for over four, almost five years. And I think that you can continuously, for us, improve the both the construction side as well as the, the energy generating side. Um, we do have remote monitoring, but of course that's that's a challenge if you don't have um, any any network. Um, so that's why we've also looked at at satellite solutions, both for monitoring the the energy usage and and consumption, or sorry, the production and consumption, as well as for for use by those you know working within the units. So I think that um, again, remote. Um, having having units in very remote locations um, is a challenge, and so we've been working in countries like in Jordan, where we we don't have our own technical team on the ground. We've been working to find local partners that can ensure response time of of you know 24 hours or less. Um, but I think that you know we we saw a revolution in the in the really the solar panel side and I think we, we continue to see improvements on, on the side for the batteries. Um, so, so technically it will continue to evolve. I think probably what's similar to the suitcase and, and our, our eHub or our kiosk is that it's integrated. The, the infrastructure and the, you know, the electrical system and energy generation is, infra is integrated together. Um, so that can provide some some durability um, and and also I think security. I think something that that we know happens is that um, you know solar panels and batteries, of course, are very valuable. So you have to ensure that that you um, that they are are kept safe and that they they can't be um, be stolen from from the system. Great, thank you very much, Virginia. Uh, we'll actually stick with you for the next question. One of our attendees is wondering how much the solar kiosk costs, um, and if it's not a set price, how do you go about determining the, the cost for installing those? Yeah, so the, as I mentioned with the, the kiosk, we, we really have a range of, of offerings. So we've actually, our original units in the field were one kilowatt peak with the, the size of the kiosk that you saw in the pictures. 
Um, we actually now are developing a new offering that will be about half the size and half the energy capacity. And our offerings go up to the size right now of the clinic that you saw in the pictures as well, 8 kilowatt peak. So the pricing really depends on the, the amount of infrastructure and then energy generation. So um, you can have, as I mentioned, like a mini kiosk that would, would start at, at something like um, 12,000 and going upward towards the, the clinic. And I think it also depends as well on what, what type of equipment is inside. Of course, with a clinic, you have um, equipment that's going to be more expensive than in um, perhaps a school or in an in a e-hub, say, that's used for a retail business. So it really depends. But of course, also, there's considerations on where it needs to go and the, the ease of implementing it. But our solution, you know, our, our standard one kilowatt peak or two kilowatt peak solutions can be really implemented in about two days with the, with the crew of, of four people. So it's really meant to be a, a solution that is as ease and, and is quick. Great. Thank you both. Um, this next question is for Tinian, and it asks, um, for the Lagos State case, um, if you had to summarize, what were the key lessons that you learned as an opportunity for improvements in future similar um, projects? Um, one, one key lesson learned is to get more private private firms involved in this process and uh, turn it commercialize commercialize the opportunity in collaboration with the state government that there's actually a possibility there especially in a state like like Lagos um, we realized that because of the size of the project and the the way in which it is actually providing solution to the clinics and primary health centers uh, Private organizations have indicated interest to the Lagos State Electricity Board that they would like an opportunity to deploy this solution and then the government can pay them over time uh, for the maintenance of this system running, running, running into the years. Um, we also realized that um, the government buy-in, especially going into future projects, is, is key really. Um, we, we, we can continue to emphasize that over and over again. Um, the only way these systems have proven to be sustainable, especially in the states that we have deployed them, is because we have state governments um, like the Kaduna state government and the Bonu state government who have just, who, who we are now in collaboration with, have actually bought into these projects. Without this, we really can't have systems of this size and this nature um, be operational. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, we are out of time. So uh, to any attendees who didn't have the chance to ask your questions, I do apologize. Um, I will gather those together and email them along uh, to the panelists so that they can have the chance to respond. Um, so we will go ahead and wrap up now. Um, on behalf of the Clean Energy Solutions Center, I do just, again, want to thank our presenters uh, for taking the time today. Great presentations, great discussion. Uh, we really appreciate you taking uh, the time to do that. And also to our attendees, uh, thank you again for, for joining in today for the webinar. Um, I invite everyone to check the Solutions Center website. If you'd like to download a PDF version of the slides, we'll be posting those, as well as a full recording of the webinar. Uh, to that the training page within about a day or two. Also, just a reminder, we're now posting webinar recordings to the Clean Energy Solutions Center YouTube channel. Uh, we have uh, over 100 videos out there of our previous webinars and other clean energy uh, topics as well. And finally, just want to remind you, as you uh, exit the webinar, a short survey will pop up. Uh, we very much appreciate your responses to that. And so with that, I hope everyone enjoys the rest of your day, and we hope to see you again at future Clean Energy Solution Center events. And this concludes our webinar.